Okay, welcome to um, lecture 11. Um, this is a fun uh, lecture um, that will help uh, buff up your fact knowledge and help you appreciate how beautiful the fact chart is. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, also teach you how to design, how to increase the number, the design space that you can search uh, with fact in a way you probably didn't realize. So, okay, it's about displacing spaces to infinity, okay? And the practical application for that. So, um, and this is going to be a, a short one. So, okay. Parallel systems can mimic serial systems. So, remember I told you, um, you know, I, I told you you can't achieve a translation, or, you know, three independent translations with nothing else, um, with just a parallel system. So, so, you know, say you wanted a system that just got X, Y, and Z translations with no rotations, no screws. That freedom space, um, I told you, cannot be achieved by a parallel system because the second you add a single wire to, to a body, you kill one of the translations. And, and there's no simpler parallel element you can add. You add that, you kill one of your three translations, you're done. So you obviously can't have a freedom space that's three translations unless you do serial or, or hybrid. In this case, this is our hybrid design that's all nice and symmetric so it can achieve your three translations only. Well, um, I kind of lied in a way. You can achieve um, uh, that freedom space with a parallel system, sort of. And it's kind of interesting to consider how. So hopefully you would agree with me that this flexure system, with this very long stage, I've just hollowed out the mass of this stage here, um, just because it's good to hollow out mass of a stage. As long as it's rigid, that's all you care about and it's acting like a rigid stage, um, you don't like mass in flexures, right? Because you want to square root K over M, you want the mass to go small so that the natural frequency is large, okay? And, and it's just also heavy and stuff. There's no good reason to have mass if you don't need it. So I've hollowed this out. But the bottom line is I just have two rigid bodies, this one and this one, and they're directly connected by parallel elements. So that you agree with me this is a parallel system. But now look at this. Because the stage is so long and far away, it kind of acts like it just achieves the three translations, X, Y, and Z. Now, the trick is, it's actually not. It's actually rotating here about torsion. That's the axis. And it's actually rotating here. Um, and it's translating here. Remember, blades, this is over-constrained because um, we've got two blades doing the same thing. Blades achieve um, uh, three degrees of freedom, this rotation, this rotation and this translation. And, you know, this one is a pure translation, so this one's actually Z, but um, this Y is only approximating a translation just because it's far away from the rotation of the actual freedom space. This freedom space is actually rotating and it's manifesting as, as like sort of a translation up, up here. And same thing here. So these aren't two, these aren't really two translations. They're approximating, they're mimicking translations, but they're really rotations far away. But, like, maybe that doesn't matter so much, you know, because it really doesn't have any other, you know, if you just look at this localized spot, which is usually what you're doing on flexures, um, you know, it, it's kind of getting the three motions you want. Um, and sure, there's parasitic error on these, but there's, there's parasitic error on these too for large deformations. So sometimes for practical purposes, you can get degree of freedom combinations that are outside, right? So remember, the, the freedom space we want, the three translations, right, from here, X, Y, and Z, three, you know, these, these three translations with no other rotations or screws is 3DOF type 10. And remember, it's outside the parallel pyramid, so it doesn't have a constraint space that could be parallel. But, you know, it turns out with this trick of pulling freedom spaces far away, from the point of interest, you can use freedom spaces within the parallel pyramid, get parallel systems, but that mimic freedom spaces outside the parallel pyramid. That's a huge point of this, this um, topic here. So, and remember, um, you know, so, so you wanted this point to purely translate over some distance d, right? Um, but of course, if you're actually rotating some distance l away from that, about this axis, you're, you're going to get this arcing motion where, sure, it'll translate D, but it'll also go down with this parasitic error E. 
But, you know, most flexures over large deformations, especially ones that aren't symmetric, even if for the very first instant you're, you're, you're nailing the motion in the freedom space you want, after that first instant, there's going to be parasitic error anyway. So, so if you can just manage this parasitic error, maybe this is as good as a translation, right? And, and here's the equation that's most useful for everything in this entire topic, which is um, it relates the translation you want to the parasitic error you want and tells you what the length needs to be. So you can derive this uh, just from geometry, trigonometry here. Um, but basically, so for an example, say a designer wishes this flexure system pos to possess a range of one millimeter. That, that means back and forth it covers a full millimeter, um, which means D here is, is 0.5 millimeters because it's 0.5 this way, 0.5 that way, right? That's one millimeter. But it should not exceed an error of one micron. That means whether it arcs this way or arcs this way, E better not be more than one micron. Okay, and so if you put, and that, that's reasonable, you know, like say, say you want, and of course the, the translation out of plane, this is going to have no parasitic error because one, it's symmetric here over its large range, and it's just, it's also a pure translation no matter where it is. So, so this one will have no parasitic error. These ones will have parasitic error. Um, but s let's see if we can manage them. Like a whole millimeter is pretty large range if, if you're wanting to tolerate a micron. And so plug the 0.5 millimeters in for D, plug one micron in for E, calculate this, and this will tell you that the length needs to be 12.5 centimeters or larger. Of course, the larger it gets, the less E gets, right? Because the less it'll arc, right? So, so that means L needs to be 12.5 centimeters or larger, which is a reasonable length, you know, in a real machine. 12.5 centimeters isn't that long. So, so you may be able, so, so the whole point here is like, my goodness, like we may be able to get all the benefits of parallel systems right, which are many, you know, they're easier to design, there's just a single stage, they're easier to analyze and optimize because there's just less stuff going on, there's less material, less weight, there's less to assemble, you know, they're just simpler designs, they, they, they keep it simple, stupid, the KISS principle applies, they're, they're lower cost, they're better dynamics, they, they can't even be under constrained, right, um, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're much simpler to design with much fewer, you know, you just have to go through one set of sub-constraint spaces, so the design approach is way easier and you've got less options, which is kind of nice. And, um, and then they're easier to actuate and control, right? Because you just need one set of actuators and sensors driving one body. Um, so, so it's like, wow, wouldn't that be nice to be able to access, uh, you know, just a, a very simple, easy to fabricate, easy to design, use parallel systems, um, but to get the motions that you, you actually want that you can't get in the parallel pyramid by mimicking them, you know, and, 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 may, and tuning that error so you can, you can tolerate the parasitic errors you're going to get through these mimicry, um, but, but still have reasonably sized stages. So, you know, and remember the advantages of serial systems is that, um, you know, okay, you can, you can have opposing motions, you can get twice the range, you can get rid of parasitic error and stuff. Um, if you design it, you know, there's no guarantee on that, but the, the main reason you want serial and hybrid systems is so you can access freedom spaces that you can't normally access, and, and you know, such as the three translations, okay? And there are, you know, a lot of these are just messy freedom spaces you wouldn't want to access anyway, but there's a number of ones outside the parallel and parallel that are really useful, like just two straight translations. So three translations and two translations are really useful. Um, and then this one we've used many times. This is a flexure coupling freedom space. Okay, this one's nice and clean. It's just a box with a sphere in it. Okay, um, this one's one that's come up a bunch. Um, boy, that would be nice to use. So, so there's a number. There, there's many that lie outside the parallel pyramid we can't access, and 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 there's a number of them that are very practical that we wish we could access. But now with this new realization, we can access them with parallel systems. We just have to manage their parasitic error, okay? So, so we get all the advantages of parallel systems, and we can get the advantages of serial systems, so we can have our cake and eat it too. And we can get some other advantages. So there's some advantages of having long stages. So of course all parallel systems that achieve, uh, or like mimic, uh, freedom spaces that are outside the parallel pyramid are going to need to have by necessity long stages. 
Well, long stages have some benefits, right? As long as you hollow them out or trussify them or something so they don't have much mass, um, you know, they, they can, um, they, they have all the advantages of parallel systems, but the flexures can be far away from them. So one of the problems is, say, you know, the point of interest will always be the top of that stage. And, um, you know, you want to get actuators in there, you want to get sensors in there. Um, you know, uh, like, like you definitely want sensors to be as close to the point of interest as possible so your measurement is as accurate, as, as good as possible. Further, your sensors are away from what you're actually measuring. The, be the worse the measurement will be, obviously. Um, and so, so, you know, traditional parallel flexure systems, the flexures are all right up close to the point of interest. But with these designs, all the flexures are of necessity very far away and you've got these long stage and this is what you care about. And so, so the flexures and the geometry and most of the design is far away. So you have plenty of space surrounding it for your sensors and you have plenty of space surrounding it for your actuators. Okay, so, okay, so, so this is starting to look pretty good. And, and by the way, you know, you just got to hollow it out. So, so um, it's looking like, my goodness, we can access all freedom spaces, um, you know, even super useful ones that are outside the parallel pyramid with parallel flexure systems um, that mimic uh, those freedom spaces. Um, we can use that equation I gave you a while back to manage and make sure the parasitic error is acceptable, which we usually have to deal with parasitic errors anyway if we don't design things to be symmetric. And, and, um, you know, and we get all this advantage of a long stage and things being far away from it so we can measure it directly. So these might not actually be that bad an idea as long as we can hollow out the stage, okay? So l let's look at displacing spaces to infinity here to understand what spaces mimic other spaces as they're displaced far away. Okay, first of all, let's re I'll remind you the math of this. Okay, so say you've got a block here, there's a rotation some distance d away, and this guy will rotate like that, um, right? And, and here it's a, like a pure rotation. You move it, uh, it's rotating there, you move it, it's rotating there, and you'll see the further the rotation gets from the actual body or the point of interest, the less it starts manifesting as a rotation, even though it's a pure rotation, and the more it starts manifesting as a translation. Now, at every point in finite space, it's not a translation, it's a pure rotation just far away, but once it reaches infinity, it is a pure translation, okay? And uh, we've done the math of that. You know, we've looked at that. We've seen as rotation twists get pulled to infinity, it turns into a translation. Um, okay, well now, now let's, you know, we've always just looked at red lines or green lines or something pulled to infinity. But what if you take an entire space and pull it to infinity? Okay, so let, let's look at this. This guy can rotate around this axis, this axis, and any red line on this plane as well as a translation there. Okay? Um, and you could visualize that. But what if the freedom space was moved away? As long as it's in finite space, it, this block is always going to just rotate around things on this plane and translate. But what happens when it reaches infinity? Well, when it reaches infinity, first of all, this translation is still the translation. It still maps to, to that uh, the translation you want, right? Because um, you can't move a translation. Um, but this rotation now becomes that translation because it's now infinitely far away, right? And it, man it not only manifests that, but if it literally reached infinity, it would be that. It's no longer mimicking it, okay? It's, it's like literally achieving it. That's what it is, is a translation when it's a rotation infinitely far away. This rotation would be that translation, and pretty much every rotation, and this translation would be that translation, of course, and every rotation on this plane would be a translation that's perpendicular to the direction it's in. So if you draw the shortest distance between this and this line, um, it'll be the direction that's perpendicular to it. Okay, so, so every single rotation on this plane, including this translation, will manifest as a sphere of translations. So that means that this space um, when pu pu displaced further and further away starts mimicking this freedom space, but when it reaches infinity, it literally becomes that freedom space. So this freedom space is, a is the same freedom space as this just manifest. This is a finite manifestation of this freedom space at infinity. Okay, pulled in that direction. All right, so 
So let's look at this. So this, this freedom space right here, okay, pulled to infinity, well, is that freedom space. So the cool thing is you can see that freedom space is in the parallel pyramid, so designs can be designed to achieve this, but if the stage is really long, so this is like far enough away from the point of interest, uh, it will approximate this one and you can achieve it outside. One thing you'll notice is this space, um, you can never, uh, you know, if you displace any space within a column, you'll always get another space within the same column, okay? Because you can't ever create or destroy a degree of freedom by pulling it to infinity, by just displacing it alone. Um, let me actually try and confuse you with that. Let me try and prove to you that's not true. <laughs> so, um, okay, so, Um, let's see if I can get a better slide to put this on. Okay, so, okay, pretend, pretend you didn't see this here. <laughs> so, so what if I had a block here in finite space, okay, and I took, um, and, and I said, okay, um, uh, let, let's say we wanted a rotation that comes out at you of the page and a translation up here, so two degrees of freedom. We've got um, a translation and a rotation, okay? Those are the two degrees of freedom. Well, if I take those degrees of freedom, if I put them right on the block, the block will rotate like this and translate up like that, right? But if I now take this, these degrees of freedom and pull them to infinity, so this becomes infinitely far away, then you might say to yourself, well, wait a minute, the translation is still the translation, right? Because you can't really move that. And that rotation is now infinitely far away. It's the same translation. So did I just take two degrees of freedom and by displacing it to infinity, did I just kill one of the degrees of freedom and just leave one degree of freedom? Uh, the answer is no. I mean, it may look like that, but that's because you're just looking at it as degrees of freedom. If you look at this as a if you look at it as a freedom space, then you would see that, um, first of all, remember, a rotation coming out at you plus a translation gets a plane of rotations, a parallel rotation. So you can imagine a bunch of parallel red lines coming, you know, it's a plane coming out at you, right, um, with a bunch of parallel red lines on it with a translation perpendicular to it. That's the better way to think about it. So if you say, well, it starts with a rotation here and a translation there, and I take that and I pull it to infinity, um, did I suddenly kill one of the degrees of freedom? No, it's just the same space. So, so if, I take, if I take that plane of parallel lines and I pull it this way, it will, it will just remain. You can see the, the, these things, there's an infinite supply of these that go forever. So no matter how much I pull it over, it'll just keep coming and it won't even change the freedom space and you don't kill one of the degrees of freedom, okay? So um, the point is, is that you can never kill, uh, you know, you're never going to add a freedom space, sorry, so if you take a set of degrees of freedom, their freedom space, and you move the freedom space, you're, you're never going to add a degree of freedom or kill a degree of freedom just by moving it. Right? It's just going to manifest differently. And if it's, if it's a two degree freedom, freedom space and you displace it, you better believe it's either going to stay the same or transform into a different two degree freedom, freedom space. But, but it'll never hop to a three or, or, or two degree freedom column. So, so um, if, if you pulled any of the spaces in three to F column to infinity, um, like, like for instance, take this one, this plane, if you pull the plane, or here, let's, let's go back and show it bigger. If you pull this plane to infinity this way, it's still going to be the plane, right? If you pull it to infinity this way, it's going to be the plane. If you pull it to infinity this way, this way, in the, in the plane of the plane, it's still going to be the plane. It's just if you pull it down, it'll turn into this. So, so there's a couple principles I've just taught you. Like, one, the same freedom space can turn into different freedom spaces depending on the direction that you pull it. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But two, you'll never, 
you'll, you'll always, if you change the freedom space by pulling a freedom space to infinity, it'll always be another freedom space in the same column. You'll never jump to a higher or lower degree of freedom because you won't kill or create a freedom space, okay, by moving it. Okay, so let's, let's look at another one. Let's look at this in the 2 f one Let's look at the disk of, of rotations, okay? Okay, if you look at that disk, let's say, let's say we draw the lines, you know, we don't bound it by the circle anymore, and we just draw those lines, and we displace it to infinity, right? It starts behaving as a bunch of parallel lines. This is the same reason I told you, you know, the sun um, has rays that are going out radially, but when the sun gets further and further away, those rays hit us at, at near parallel angles because it's so far away, right? If it was literally infinitely far away, they would perfectly be parallel. Which tells us if we take this freedom space and displace it to infinity in that direction, it manifests as a plane of parallel red lines, and this, this red line will manifest as a translation. Actually, I don't like how I drew that. That, that should be parallel to this, this, this line here. So it's the one that's perpendicular uh, you know, to, to this, this line here. Okay, so, so and it, it's kind of cool to think, all these red lines that sweep from there to there, this whole half the circle fills this infinite plane with red parallel lines. And then when, it's, when, it's, uh, when the, the red line is perpendicular to these red lines, it, it, man it is the hoop that causes the translation. And then all the red lines on the other half go, you know, this is at infinity, which is the same point as positive infinity over here, and comes and fills the plane the other way. Because remember, all these lines are really circles with, with infinite radii with no beginning or end, right? So they come from the other direction as well, which is, you know, the, the other rotations on the other half go this way and loop around and come there, right? So, so this is basically a finite manifestation of this pulled to infinity in that direction, okay? And again, they're, they're both 2DOF, so we didn't create or destroy anything by pulling it. Okay, well, what if we took this and pull it in a different direction? What if we pull this down like that? Well, now every single one of those rotations will manifest as a translation in a disk that's perpendicular to them, okay, once it reaches infinity. So um, we just showed that, um, yes, the same freedom space, depending on the direction you pull it, or, or the same freedom space can manifest as different freedom spaces when it's displaced to infinity depending on the direction you pull it. Okay, but again, this is 2 f's, that's 2 f's. You're never going to create or destroy freedom spaces by displacing them. So this one could become this one, and it also could become that one, depending on what direction you pull it. Okay, and they're in the same column. You're never going to jump to a different column. You're never going to destroy a space, right? Um, this, by the way, let's see here. This, by the way, you know, it, it, depending on whether you pull it in this direction or that direction, it's going to stay the same, as I showed you on the board, um, right? Um, yeah, okay. So, all right. Um, okay, so, so what I've done is I've created a table of shapes that displays to infinity, okay? This table of shapes can tell you um, essentially, it, it provides a complete list of freedom spaces that mimic other freedom spaces when displaced to infinity in every direction. So it doesn't contain information about the direction, but it'll tell you what things can, what they can turn into. So for instance, um, say I look up 2 to f uh, type 5. Okay, this says 2 to f type 5. It says 2 to f type 5 is mimicked when types 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 are displaced to infinity. So that means if we look up 2 to f on this column, type 5 here, okay? Let's see, so let's remember this. So 2 to f type 5 is minimum types 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Okay, so let's go to here. So, okay, so according to that table, if I look up 2 to f type 5, this freedom space, okay, is achieved if I take freedom space 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, and displace them to infinity in some direction will manifest as this guy, okay? And I don't tell you what direction, so you kind of have to figure that out with the math I'm going to give you and your ability to intuit these things, but I at least tell you which ones can be used to mimic that one, okay? And I do it for everything, not just the ones outside the parallel pyramid, 
but, but like this one I just showed you, the ones inside the parallel pyramid, I go through and tell you every single, you know, you look up, you know, 3DF type 10, and it will, it'll tell you what things can mimic it, okay? And some of these you can't mimic. So, for instance, 3DF type 10 cannot be mimicked by displacing anything to infinity. So look at 3DOF type 10 here, okay? Nothing in this column or outside the column, of course, nothing in ever outside the column, but nothing in this column can be displaced to infinity to mimic this, okay? So something is just like it's the only one you can do, okay? And those are ones of worth, of, of note. So look at this, type, you know, type 7, uh, you know, through, I don't know, 14. Anyway, a bunch of these, they, they can't be mimicked by displacing something to infinity. They, they just can't be mimicked at all. They are just, um, you need to use them as they are. Okay, so, so that's another interesting insight is that um, some spaces can't be mimicked by pulling things to infinity. Other things can, and other things can, a lot of them pulled to infinity. Um, like, for instance, type 3 do have type 20 we're going to look at is mimicked when types 1, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 20, 21, 22 are displaced to infinity. So pretty much almost everything in column 3, with the exclusion of some of them, when they're displaced to infinity in some direction, can mimic 3DUF type 20. And so, so some of them are mimicked by a lot of them, some of them can't be mimicked at all, okay? But they all turn into each other within the, the, their own column. Okay, and this, this library is very important um, because it, it's rigorous and complete and tells you all of your options if you want to mimic something. Like, you know, if it's something outside or inside the parallel pyramid, you want to design a parallel system with a long stage that mimics it um, according to how long the stage is. You'd want to consult this chart if you can't do it uh, you know, in your own head and see all your different, see if there's even an option, but um, see, if, you know, see what your options are and then figure out what direction you'd need to pull those options. Okay. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, so, so before, I, before I go on, I, I want to just tell you a couple other things um, that, that are interesting. So, um, first of all, a lot of these spaces um, beautifully turn into each other either by changing parameters or by displacing things to infinity, as, as we've shown. So, so um, for instance... Um, you know, you could imagine this, this, this shape, that's a disk and a plane of parallel red lines. If, if the angle between that disk and plane of parallel red lines, it's drawn here 90 degrees, but it could be any angle. If it is 0 or 180 degrees, that will pop, that'll turn into this, right? And, and the same thing with those, those interlocking disks. You remember the 3 of type 9. If, if they rotate uh, and be on the same plane, it'll turn into this one. But, but think, of, think of those disks. They're actually some of the most interesting. Say we take those disks and we just pull one to infinity, right? Well, we leave the other one in finite space. Well, that one we pull to infinity will manifest as a plane of parallel lines, and it will turn into this guy. Okay, so if we take this one but leave part of the space in finite space and pull the other to infinity, it'll manifest as this guy. Okay? If, if we pull the other one to infinity, it manifests as the same guy, just rotated. Okay? If we pull both to infinity, say an opposing direct... Well, first of all, if we, if we put both on top of each other, to this, it'll turn into this one. It'll be a sphere, right? If we take two uh, interlocking disks and, and put them on top of each other, it'll turn into a sphere. Um, obviously, if we pull that sphere to infinity in one direction, it'll turn into the box... Okay, but, but check this out. If you take the two disks like this and you pull this one to infinity this way, so it manifests as the parallel lines, and you pull this one to infinity this way, so it manifests the other parallel lines this way, then you could see those would add together to be the box. And the other crazy thing is if you pull, you know, if you think, you could think of it, if you pull this to infinity and you pull this to infinity the other direction, positive and negative infinity are the same point. So you might as well think of this on top of it over here at infinity, which is the sphere at infinity, which is also the box in finite space. So you can see how it all kind of beautifully ties together, whether you um, change parameters and they morph into each other, or you displace a portion of the space to infinity and it morphs into another, or you displace the whole space to infinity, morphs into another, and depending on the direction you pull it, it morphs into another. So they're really all just one and the same shape within the entire column of all the columns 
just morphing into different manifestations in finite or 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 or, or, or uh, in, you know uh, 